Welcome back to the show. Today we're talking about the important issue of fighting for the lives of Canadians with Dr. Paul Saba from Lachine, Quebec. I think everybody should have the opportunity to live and uh, many of our healthcare policies that are being promoted really go against that model of healthcare. The key issue was you care for everybody who needs care. It's to give life a chance. It's a false narrative to say that if you're against assisted suicide or euthanasia, you're for suffering. I'm totally opposed to suffering. Whenever I have patients who are having pain management control issues, I send them to specials. They're always promoting promoting assisted suicide. So we'll give you your choice. Well, that's not really a choice when you don't have a lots of alternatives or people are psychologically distressed. We need to give people all the support they need. The fight for the lives of Canadians. Obviously, this topic has been front and center in the news for over a year as it relates to COVID-19. And yet within the medical community itself, there are varying perspectives on how resources should be allocated and whose care should be prioritized. These types of wrestles come into play when ICU beds are in short supply, when doctors and nurses are in short supply, when public funding is dwindling, and of course, when it comes to the controversial issue of the expansion of medical assistance in dying to the mentally and physically vulnerable. Who lives and who dies? Who do we fight for and who do medical professionals consider not fighting for? For many, it's shocking that these conversations are even happening in Canada today, but they are. My guest, Dr. Paul Saba, has been weighing into this conversation for years. He's a successful practicing physician from Quebec, and he's also the co-founder and co-president of the Coalition for Physicians for Social Justice. He's the author of Made to Live, a book that chronicles his own family's personal journey on the topic. I'm grateful to have him with us today for this deeply personal but deeply important conversation regarding the care of Canadians. So without further delay, let's get to it. So Jessica is feeding right now and how many days is she how old is jessica today the title really came out of the inspiration of my daughter and the story of, of my daughter started back in 2009 before she was born at uh, 20 weeks on the ultrasound the medical team took us aside and said you know we're sorry to say this but your future baby has a severe problem a severe congenital malformation and we said well what do you mean by that they said well she doesn't have a viable heart and she probably has has down syndrome and we really question whether she's going to have any quality of life and whether she could even survive and so they said to us that you should consider your your medical options and i said uh, medical options what do you mean well if you're going to terminate the pregnancy you should do it now we did another ultrasound 24 weeks, four weeks later, and it was the same conclusion. And we said, absolutely not. We're, we're not going to terminate this pregnancy. As my wife says, I've done everything to get the pregnancy as far as, as I have, and you're going to do everything for, for my baby. Who has to be taking her home? The greatest abandonment is giving up on people, and the worst way of abandoning is killing them, either through assisted suicide or euthanasia, or through abortion. So that's what the story is, is how every human life is valuable, whether you're pre-born, after birth, or even at the end of a, of a long life. Uh, but never give up, always have hope. You are valuable because you are made to live. Well, Dr. Saba, thank you so much for joining me today. What an important conversation, talking about life and death. And you've been at this for a little while, both from the physician standpoint of fighting for lives, but also from the cultural commentary standpoint. For our viewers right now, give us a little bit of an introduction about your medical background and why you're so passionate about this conversation today. Well, I was born and raised in Lachine, Quebec, Canada, which is uh, now part of Montreal. And a 
really the interest in medicine has uh, been a lifelong uh, passion. Uh, I started off as a Boy Scout uh, doing first aid, and that really motivated me to go on and, and continue my studies in medicine, which I did at McGill University in Montreal. Went on to the USA, uh, into the Boston area, where I did my specialization in internal medicine. And, um, and my journey has been quite, a, uh, quite varied. Um, after uh, spending uh, close to 10 years in Massachusetts, I decided to go off and uh, do some work in Haiti and Bangladesh. And I really enjoyed that uh, so much that I, um, I took on a project uh, in the Ivory Coast with a, a Cause Canada uh, in, uh, in terms of doing community health work and really training the community on good health practices. And also we even uh, expanded into uh, small businesses. They call it micro enterprise. So it really was a very comprehensive work and I really enjoyed that, but came at, uh, uh, later on in the, in the 90s back to Montreal, my home base. Uh, and I've been here ever since and very involved in, in uh, not only my medical practice, but in many uh, medical causes, social causes, and, um, and I've really, you know, of course, uh, the major reason I've, I've stayed here in Montreal is because I married uh, my wife, who's uh, uh, not of Lebanese, uh, Italian background, so the children always joke that they're hybrids. Um, and we've, uh, con I've continued on uh, fighting for health care and health care causes. Amazing. And in a moment, I want to edge into something that's pretty controversial right now, and that's some of the procedures and policies that are being advocated for in Quebec. But before we get to that conversation, Dr. Saba, I'd love to talk a little bit about your philosophy in medicine. You know, you talk a lot about the value of life, about fighting for people to live. Um, unpack that a little bit for us before we edge into what's happening here in Quebec. I think everybody should have the opportunity to live. And uh, many of our healthcare policies that are being promoted really go against that model of healthcare. Um, you know, we go back to the Hippocratic Oath uh, uh, close to 2,500 years ago which uh, basically said, do no harm. And, uh, you know, don't uh, pre prematurely end people's life. And that goes all the way back to Hippo Hippocrates. And then you, you, you move things up uh, to modern medicine, which is based on the Judeo-Christian ethic. You know, and in my book, I, my first quote is from the uh, Mishnah, which says that if you save a, a, a life, uh, you save the world. And um, that philosophy continued in the teachings of the Good Samaritan, which Jesus uh, taught. Uh, his, his disciples in the world is that uh, um, when he was asked, who is your neighbor? And Jesus uh, told a lawyer, he says, uh, he gave the story of the Good Samaritan. And the Samaritan was a person who on a road found somebody left half dead, bound up his wounds with uh, olive oil and wine, because that's all they had, uh, took him to the inn on his donkey and told the innkeeper, he says, uh, whatever uh, you know, uh, please take care of him and here's some money and whatever more you need to do, I'll pay you when I come back. We never know what the outcome of this person was left half dead on the road, whether he survived or whether he never made it. Uh, but the key issue was you care for everybody who needs care. And right now what we're having in Quebec and also in Ontario, I saw the directives, uh, the similar directives stating that um, if the emergency, if the intensive cares get o overrun, uh, and they're saying 150 to 200 uh, percent capacity uh, that uh, cer only certain people should be treated. And so um, this is totally unacceptable. And in fact, they've even uh, have special uh, similar like directives for uh, children uh, who are not survivable. And I and I reference in, in my articles that I've written that my, my daughter uh, would not be a survivor today in this type of world that they're talking about because she was born with a severe uh, cardiac malformation, and, uh, and and the story goes as, as I told you uh, in in my book uh, that we were told uh, not to even bring her to term, which uh, we both, my wife and myself, uh, opposed. And we said, um, whatever God brings us, uh, we will continue. He'll give us the means to to carry on, and and we have. And and uh, she's amazing. And of course, of course, the title of the book, uh, Made to Live, comes from a drawing that she that she did. Our daughter Jessica. Wow, powerful, powerful. I want to encourage people to 
check that book out to Tracy down on uh, Amazon or anywhere that uh, you can pick that up and uh, make sure that you read that book. And in that book, Dr. Saba, you not only talk about your experience with Jessica, your own daughter, but you also in your book talk about some other stories uh, that highlight this conversation as well. What are, what are some of those other stories featured in the book? Uh, well, of course, they talk about my father-in-law who uh, had um, a severe form of cancer uh, and was after being operated on, there was one complication after the other was 21 days on the ventilator. Um, and uh, he's, uh, this was back in 2010. And, and today he's, he's, he's alive and well, he's uh, Italian background. Uh, so he teaches my kids uh, how to uh, do Italian gardening, which I'm not very good at, I try. Uh, he's much better than me at that and how to make pizza. Uh, so, I mean, he's a very active person, helps his, uh, his son in his in the garage business. And then one more more story that I think is very uh, profound is a uh, patient uh, a little over a year ago came to my office and had a spot on his lung after we did a chest X-ray. I thought it was just a, a bronchitis and or pneumonia. And um, and I said we have to investigate this. And right away he put his hand up. He said, "Doctor, stop. I know where you come from, but I don't necessarily agree with you." You know, he says, "When my time comes, my time comes." Because with the assisted suicide euthanasia law you don't have to do investigations and a person can opt to be uh, euthanized or life ended um, even without doing studies, but we were able, uh, him, I was able with his daughter to convince him to go through the investigations and, and it, it looked from, uh, from bad to worse that it probably was cancer, but finally after uh, uh, several attempts at biopsies, we found he had a Hodgkin's lymphoma, which uh, has been treated and it looks successfully. We can, of course, know uh, you have to wait five years, but there's no uh, evidence of disease. And he's a 50 year old engineer and he thanks me and he, and he listens to whenever I do webinars and he's just like a, a strong advocate for, uh, for life now. Wow. So, uh, and he doesn't come from any type of uh, religious background, just a very secular background. So, uh, you know, the, the purpose of the book is, is give life a chance where there's life, there's hope. And it doesn't mean we have to force people to do treatments. I've never advocated forcing treatments or forcing a person to go on a ventilator. If a person says, I want to come off a ventilator, I've had enough, uh, you know, we, we ease them off. But it's to give life a chance. And what's happening in, 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 in Quebec and in Ontario with all these uh, restrictions to ICU access is totally unacceptable. It's kind of a mindset that only certain lives are worthy of life and everyone else, uh, it's, it's a real lottery. And I want to dive deep into that in here in just a moment, in particular, what's happening in Quebec and Ontario. But before I do, you know, my observation is that there seems to be two sort of ideological tracks in medicine that are regularly put forth. One is this deeply, um, deeply driven agenda to alleviate suffering right, where we want to alleviate suffering and, and our goal is to alleviate suffering. And then the other is to fight for life. And those aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. I think we can fight for life and alleviate suffering at the same time. But, you know, do you have any commentary on that, on these two different philosophies of medicine and how those two can rub up against each other at times? Yeah, well, they're, they, they are complementary. They go together. Uh, so it's a false narrative to say that if you're against assisted suicide or euthanasia, you're for suffering. I'm totally opposed to suffering. And I, and I uh, whenever I have patients who are having, uh, you know, pain management control issues, I send them to specialists. The problem is there's a lack of them. But I do the best. I, I use the resources I have. I use uh, pharmacists. Uh, there's palliative care physicians I, I can consult. And palliative care is not just for somebody at the end of life. Many of my patients who have chronic diseases who are going to go and live for years, I will consult a palliative care specialist. The problem is the government hasn't invested adequately in that. You know, they're always promoting, promoting assisted suicide. So we'll give you your choice. Well, that's not really a choice when you don't have a lots of alternatives or people are psychologically distressed and they don't have access to psychologists. Now they're increasing of that, uh, of course, because of COVID and I've written a number of articles on that too topic. Uh, we need to give people all the support they need, including palliative care. And that doesn't mean palliative care just when you're dying, but palliative care when you have chronic issues. You know, the uh, Supreme Court just, justice decision was based on a woman with a chronic back problem. Uh, arthritis, people aren't aware of it. She, this person wasn't dying. And um, 
Uh, and that's what's sad. The, the, the courts have not addressed that issue. They say, well, it doesn't matter uh, uh, that there aren't uh, adequate health care in place. And I say it does matter. Just because the court says it doesn't matter doesn't mean it doesn't matter. It matters because human life is valuable and we have to give people everything they need. Powerful. You know, it all started out really this spring when the, the government sent out directives telling um, first responders not to resuscitate people. You could be 20, 30 years old, drop of a heart attack or 40 years old from, from whatever condition, and they were not resuscitating people. We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference, and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 1-866-844-0844 to donate today. So for those that might not be following what's happening in Quebec on this whole issue in Ontario, could you just completely unpack here what exactly the policy is that the CMA and, and others are putting forth in Quebec as it relates to um, COVID-19 management in ICU? Yeah, well, um, you know, it all started off really this spring when the, the government sent out directives telling um, first responders not to resuscitate people. You could be 20, 30 years old, drop of a heart attack or 40 years old from, from whatever condition, and they were not resuscitating people. That's how far away we've gone from valuing life. Uh, was it because they were concerned about people catching uh, COVID? Maybe, but you know, with a modern um, resuscitation techniques, you don't, you don't do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation anymore. So it made no, no sense with, uh, with personal protective equipment for having that. That was brought out. And I wrote about it. It was stopped. This policy was stopped. Um, uh, uh, the government uh, realized that they had maybe gone too far, but then they put out directives uh, and sending it to all the hospitals and doctors, uh, new ICU directives, limiting access to care, saying, well, we may not have enough uh, ICU beds. And therefore, if we reach 150 to 200% capacity, that means, uh, oh, you know, uh, you know, the CU. You only have 100 beds, but you, you need a 200 or 150 beds. Uh, we won't let you in the ICU unless you can meet the scoring system, um, which really um, people who are sicker are less likely to get in, which goes against with ICUs, intensive care. Usually we give people who need more care uh, better access. Uh, and, I, and I've written out, and this goes against uh, even the Canadian Medical Association, which is a, a bit of a rogue uh, in terms of their bit, they've gone rogue on lots of issues because the World Medical Association has said no. The World Medical Association has uh, more than 10 million doctors in, in 113 countries. It says you should provide all the critical care beds that you need. You know, I, I just think it's, you know, and I just recently wrote an article saying that, you know, because the government says we don't have enough beds, or if then they argue, well, we do have enough beds, but we don't have enough personnel. And, and in my recent article, I wrote, basically says you can graduate uh, nurses earlier, uh, medical students earlier, residents earlier, um, respiratory technicians earlier, in the front lines have them in support capacity, in their semi-retired nurses and doctors, uh, let also work, not necessarily in front, and, and uh, have ICU doc trained doctors, anesthesiologists uh, on top of the, of, the, of the pyramid. And so they have all these helpers down below and you can, you can double, and, and one study actually said you can uh, make your capacity 500%. I presented these studies, and so they're, they're, they're well-founded in, in the literature. So uh, this, the, problem is, the problem is governments are looking for quick, easy solutions, and uh, you don't do quick, easy solutions for uh, when, when life is concerned. Wow. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's a way, and it sounds like you And I also am very critical of our federal government. Um, federal government for years and years has been decreasing their contribution to healthcare doc, uh, dollars. Uh, they used to give 50 cents uh, to the dollar. Uh, now they're only around 23 cents. Uh, and the provinces are, are scrambling um, for, for, for more money to uh, keep their healthcare systems going. So um, I, I blame the federal government for not stepping up. It's easy for the federal government to talk about assisted suicide, euthanasia, 
you know, uh, you know, say, well, we'll give them, you know, uh, they need bread, but we'll give them cake. This is not cake. This is this is poison. Wow. Well, you're definitely giving us a lot to think about here, <laughs> Dr. Sava. I want to go back to something that you said just a few moments ago about the approach in Quebec right now, uh, prioritizing really the healthy, right, or the most healthy in need, as opposed to in the past where there's been more of a priority put upon those that are most in need, which seems logical. So why the flip ideologically here? And are any of your colleagues in um, the medical profession also flagging this flip and asking tough questions about it? Yeah, I've seen my colleagues uh, uh, questioning it uh, and saying that this doesn't make sense. And their response by administrators, we have no choice. And, uh, but we do have choices. <laughs> you know, I think uh, sometimes uh, administrators, uh, governments look for quick, easy solutions and to, to take the hard steps to uh, find more beds to to amp ramp up um, the care that people need is more difficult. And uh, my colleagues, uh, being uh, frontline workers and physicians working, uh, don't always uh, uh, take the time to you know do the research. I uh, my background has been I did a master's in cancer research, so I have I've always enjoyed doing research and asking questions and and writing articles, and that's why I wrote my book. Um, so I don't think uh, people necessarily have that reflex to, to question. And, uh, and I've, uh, my whole life, I've always questioned. I've always wanted to find a better solution. You know, um, I, my, my mom um, and my family brought me up with this can-do attitude. You know, um, I mean, we look at, you know, we're, we've been able to get uh, uh, men on the moon. Uh, we've been able to find all types of cures and for diverse uh, diseases. Uh, we've even been able to come up with a vaccine for COVID in less than a year. Uh, we can do things if we want to do it, and we just have to put our mind to it. And that includes government officials. Absolutely. Now, one thing I love about our viewers, Dr. Saba, is that they are also can-do people. They, they hear a show like this, an interview like this, and I know many of them are automatically saying, what can we do to be a part of being a, a positive contributor to this, this narrative? So what can people do? Obviously, if they're in Quebec, they can be emailing the Premier, their members of the Legislative, uh, the National Assembly, the Legislative Assemblies in different provinces. Anything else people can be doing? Uh, I would encourage them not just to write to them, but to call them. Uh, uh, people have shown when you pick up the phone and call, obviously <clears throat> having meetings today is more difficult, <clears throat> unless it's a Zoom meeting, but uh, pick up the phone and, and, and you know, email, write your, your legislators um, and just tell them that say, listen, th this is unacceptable. And even on this whole debate of uh, assisted suicide and euthanasia says, no, we want more care. We want more palliative care. We don't want people who have disabilities uh, to be opened up, uh, to, to, to be encouraged to, to end their lives. The C7 uh, bill is going to be expanding assisted suicide and euthanasia to uh, people with disabilities. Uh, this is based on um, the government opening up that way here in Quebec uh, for uh, two people that went to court uh, uh, to drop that restriction if you had disabilities and that you, could, you, you didn't have a terminal illness. And uh, the government doesn't have to, it's too dangerous. In fact, the government could um, use the notwithstanding clause. And that's why we have uh, uh, governments and why we have legislators. Uh, it's not the courts that decide on laws. They can make suggestions, they can make recommendations, but finally it's up to the legislature. And the Canadian government is going down the wrong road. This is unacceptable. This will do more harm than good. Uh, innocent people will lose their lives. People who've given up because of disabilities or uh, they're having uh, trouble to uh, get support they need. This is where the government should be doing, providing more support, more care. Uh, and now they're even talking about expanding to people with depressed uh, illnesses, people who have mental illness and are depressed, and they're making this sound like this is the, the, best, the best thing that could be done. This is wrong. This is not medicine. And they're even talking about expanding it to children. And uh, I think our um, the public need to know that they'll have very little say. This has already happened where families have tried to intervene and stop their loved ones who are depressed, who thought they had a, an illness, even who uh, ending their lives prematurely. So this is why I think uh, the viewers need to stand up. Um, if they need uh, more information, they can obviously go to our website, madetolive.com, but also get the book. 
and have the tools to speak to their legislators, speak to family, to speak to their communities. And it's important that everybody stands up because we do make a difference. Powerful. Powerful. Well, these are heavy conversations. These are intense uh, times of deliberation, but I, I'm just so grateful for you, uh, Dr. Saba, because you bring hope, right? It's people like you who are speaking out, bringing another perspective, showing compassion. Uh, I love your, your focus on alleviating suffering, but also fighting for life and giving people every option that they uh, can possibly have to live and to live a, a beautiful life. And so thank you for what you do. Now, people can find you. You said Made to Live is, is the website there. You've also got the Coalition of Physicians for Social Justice. If people want to find out about that organization, where can they go? Well, they can go to coalitionmd.org, uh, coalitionmd.org. But the most recent um, articles and uh, stories I have is on the uh, made to live.com and I think that's really important coalition talks about the various activities I have fought for uh, saving our community hospital at St. Joseph's and Lachine uh, fighting for uh, free medications for those who could not afford to pay for them and encouraging physical fitness in, in, in the youth all those activities are still very timely and important but right now I think the key is to support life and that's why I encourage you to go to made to live.com Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Saba, for your time today. Any final words for our viewers? No, just uh, don't give up. Uh, there's always hope. We never know what's around the, the corner. Uh, and that's why it's important that we just don't give up. Well, thank you for those words and thank you for what you do. Thank you for joining me today for this very eye-opening and very important conversation with Dr. Paul Saba regarding caring for Canada's most vulnerable. I really appreciate that you tune in every single week. And if you're still watching the show at this point, it's because you genuinely care about Canada, about these important conversations. And I believe that you, like myself and our team here, want to be a part of building a better Canada for the future. And so I can't end this program without giving a personal, heartfelt, shout out to all of our viewers, but also all of our monthly donors and our regular donors. Those of you that watch this on a regular basis know that we are a listener supported program. We can only do this show because of the generous contributions of our monthly partners and regular donors. And we're also grateful to be able to say that all gifts are tax receivable. So we want to invite you to join our partnership team. It's super easy. All you need to do is give us a quick call at 1-866-844-0844 and myself or my husband or one of our team members would be happy to chat with you and set you up, answer any question that you have and pray for you as well. You can also do it online at fateen.tv where you can donate or you can see this show and other programs on other important topics as well. You can watch them there. You can share them with your friends and let's continue to band together to build a better Canada for the future. Thanks again for joining me today. I hope to see you next week.